Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is a, a great pleasure to join uh, once again my friend and colleague Fabrizio Hothschild in welcoming you to this fourth in a series of five webinars on global digital cooperation during the COVID-19 crisis. Our strategic partner for today's discussion is UNODC. Uh, this week's topic, as you heard from Zhang He, is on online safety and security, which is, of course, extremely pertinent uh, at this time when the world has never been so reliant on digital networks and services. It's also, of course, very relevant to my own agency, the ITU, which was charged by the World Summit on the Information Society uh, back in 2005 with the responsibility to facilitate efforts in building confidence and security in the use of, of ICTs. As I remarked on, on the first of these webinars, digital has really been the hidden hero of this crisis, but of course heightened dependency on digital infrastructure also significantly raises the cost of failure of those networks and platforms. And it also lures a host of bad actors that are seeking to exploit the global emergency. Cybercrime thrives on fear and uncertainty, and some criminals use that fear to penetrate systemic defenses. Cyber attacks that deprive organizations or families of access to their devices, their data, or their internet can be devastating and even deadly. In a worst case scenario, a major cyber attack could cause widespread infrastructure failures that would take out entire communities or cities offline at a time when connectivity has never been more important. We have already seen healthcare providers targeted, the attack in March on the, the Bruno University Hospital that forced it to shut down the hospital's entire IT network, we saw the ransomware attack on a British vaccine developer that led to private information being disclosed online. Other criminals are also taking advantage of civil panic to defraud, uh, devising very creative ways to exploit users and technology to access passwords, networks, and data, luring victims to popular topics and online trends. Criminals are using the COVID-19 crisis to launch social engineering attacks like phishing campaigns and more targeted attacks. On one of our earlier dialogues, Vodafone told us that they've seen a spike in phishing traffic of 300% across their networks. Others still use the web to deliberately spread misinformation. And in the past few days alone, the coronavirus statistics site Worldometers and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services have both been the target of cyber attackers, and they have tried to disrupt public access to reliable information. <clears throat> so in a moment, we're going to hear from a very special guest who's going to speak about the darkest side of cybercrime, and that is child online exploitation and abuse. But for the moment, I would once again like to... Um, it gives me enormous pleasure to hand the floor over to Undersecretary Fabrizio Hothschild, uh, who's going to give us his framing remarks for this discussion. Fabrizio, over to you. Uh, I'd like to greet all of you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us again in this important series of, of webinars. Uh, and I'd especially like uh, to, to pass on a warm greeting uh, and my, my deepest thanks to our very uh, distinguished group of panelists who have been so kind as to give their time um, to us uh, for this discussion. Um, as Doreen highlighted, the, our increased online presence uh, has created a, a huge opportunity for increased online crime. Uh, and in fact, um, the, uh, the criminals have outpaced um, the increase in tra traffic and have been um, more diligent. I think there are three areas um, where they're most active. One is obviously for financial gain um, through, through ransomware and, and other means. Uh, another is simply for, for disruption. And I've had a first um, hand experience of that in a, in a Zoom hacking um, event. And the third and perhaps the most pernicious, which Doreen alluded to at the end of her remarks, 
is for exploitation and abuse. Um, and I'm afraid that, uh, as Doreen also indicated, the coronavirus environment um, has been conducive um, for this. And coronavirus itself has been exploited uh, by those with um, negative objectives. We've seen this um, one through targeted attacks uh, on WHO, which has seen a massive increase on attacks on its websites. Uh, we've seen attacks on, on hospitals. Um, and one of the biggest fears is that there could be attacks that would in effect try and derail or slow down or stop um, attempts uh, at um, developing um, uh, medi medication that could speed up um, coronavirus cures or um, even uh, try and disrupt the development uh, of a, of a, of a um, uh, uh, of a cure. So that, that is one major concern. The other is the coronavirus um, information is being used as a lure. So uh, people are trying to plant trans, uh, ransomware through um, coronavirus websites, often with false uh, information. And the third area where coronavirus, uh, the environment of coronavirus is being exploited is with regard to the um, uh, increased uh, and often unsupervised presence of children um, on, online, which is pro providing a, a very fertile ground for increased efforts um, at child uh, exploitation uh, and abuse. And that is perhaps the largest um, concern that, that deserves further focus. Uh, and this happens against a backdrop uh, of where um, those who want to perpetuate child abuse uh, and exploitation have adapted extremely well to the digital world. And even prior to coronavirus, we saw a disproportionate increase in such attacks. And that has been furthered through this uh, peculiar um, environment. So with that, let me hand over to our, our panelists. And we're very, very lucky to have a very distinguished group so back to you, uh, Doreen. Uh, so thank you very much, Fabrizio. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, our first speaker today needs no introduction through her longstanding commitment to children's rights, uh, her tireless work to protect the most vulnerable. She is recognized as a global unifying voice for children. In 1999, she founded World Childhood Foundation uh, to inspire and in, invest in solutions to prevent violence and sexual abuse of, of, of children. Ten years later, together with her husband, His Majesty King Carl Gustav XVI, she established the Global Childhood Forum to engage in private sector, to get the private sector engaged in, in children's rights, and she was very quick to recognize the power and the importance of the internet for child safety, engaging in both technical solutions and also last year hosting a very high level roundtable at the Royal Palace in Stockholm on how to leverage the power of artificial intelligence for child online safety. And I was absolutely honored to have been part of that event. She is a remarkable global advocate and was recently named the Queen of, of Children and it is now my great honor and privilege to introduce to you Her Majesty, Her Majesty Queen Sylvia of Sweden. Your Majesty, the floor is yours, please. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a true pleasure to join this digital conversation about a topic that is very close to my heart. Online meetings are still fairly new to me, but I'm quickly getting adjusted to new ways of handling life, as we all are in these unusual times. COVID-19 has changed the way we live. It has forced many of us to make difficult sacrifices in our personal lives. But it has also given us an opportunity to reflect and focus on what is generally important for us. It gives me hope to see that in the past months, the safety of children has been highlighted more often than usual in the public debate. 
The COVID-19 response has accentuated the social importance of school and extracurricular activities and the importance of having trusted, caring adults around the, our children. The current crisis has also intensified and accentuated the value as well as the risks with the online world. We all know that digital solutions have made it possible for us to keep in contact with friends and family despite social distancing, to continue study despite school closures, and to spread messages about how to keep children safe. However, we also hear worrying reports about more intense activity on darknet communities for abusers, an increase in grooming attempts and a sharp rise in calls to child helplines. This makes me deeply concerned. I'm truly worried about the long-term effects of this crisis, especially for the children who are already at increased risk. And we know that children most at risk offline are usually the ones that are most at risk also online. We must also remember when we speak about online child sexual abuse, that even though the crime is committed online, the perpetrator is not digital and neither is the victim. These children are real and the crimes committed against them may stay on the internet forever. I welcome the joint statements and recommendations made by many of you present in this meeting. The Broadband Commission COVID Agenda for Action, the joint technical note on COVID-19 and its implications for protecting children online, as well as the joint call for action to protect children during COVID-19 by several global leaders, manifest a global joint effort to protect children online. They all provide valuable guidelines for governments, organizations and private companies, especially technology companies and internet service providers. I do want to stress that the heightened risk of online harm for children put a particular responsibility on tech companies and service providers. This is not the time to lessen the priority on children's safety. On the contrary, this is the time to do everything in our power to keep children safe online. The virus knows no borders and online perpetrators respect no borders. Therefore, we need to work together across borders making sure that the recommendations that have been developed are turned into concrete action is one very good way to start. Whether we are artificial intelligence experts, policy makers, or just parents, in these difficult times, it is more important than ever that we all contribute with whatever we do best, and most importantly, that we do it now. Thank you. Thank you, Your Majesty. And congratulations to you and to World Childhood Foundation for the tremendous and important work that you do. I think your message was very clear. We need to move from recommendations to concrete actions and work together across borders. Thank you so much. Uh, Dear colleagues, it is a tragic reality of our world that some people always seek to capitalize on a crisis. And we heard from Fabrizio that worldwide organizations are reporting dramatic increases in cyber attacks and cyber crime. Uh, we've heard about the surges in, in phishing, uh, the tens of, of millions of, of malware emails detected by Google in just one week. Uh, and a doubling of suspected online child exploitation cases reported to the U.S. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. 
I suspect we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg with many countries simply lacking the technical and human capacity to track the level of malicious content passing through their networks. These threats are not new, but in today's challenging context, they represent an order of magnitude risk to our society, our economy, and our children. Right now, we are playing catch up, as Fabrizio mentioned, we're playing catch up with the criminals. So can we envisage a future where we get the upper hand or where we stamp out cybercrime and online abuse? So I'd like to call now on today's distinguished panelists to give their views. Uh, unfortunately, I will also have to be the timekeeper. Uh, each speaker will have five minutes. Uh, at four minutes, I will hold up my yellow card. And at, at five minutes, I will hold up my red card. Um, and so what we're going to do first is look a, a bit deeper, focusing on how cyber threats are evolving to take advantage of the COVID crisis. And what are the cyber threats that are specifically targeting children? And our first speaker, is Madame Wally. She's the executive director of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Uh, she's also the director general of the UN office in Vienna. Uh, she has a wealth of experience having served in a number of high level positions in the Egyptian government. I think she's joining us today from Cairo. Uh, Madame Wally, if you could tell us how are cyber threats evolving, taking advantage of, of COVID-19 crisis and what are you seeing at UNODC? Please. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen, for the introduction and the moderation. Thank you, Fabrizio, for inviting me. And it's an honor to join this panel with many friends of the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. I would like to thank Her Majesty for her steadfast support to UNODC's work over many, many years and for her support to children globally. I, can, I would like also to share with Her Majesty the deep concern about keeping children safe while online during this crisis. I look forward to having the opportunity to meet all of you and indeed uh, all of our distinguished participants in person when we can do that. I'm also grateful to be joining the uh, Executive Director of Europol uh, in addressing the question of how cyber threats have evolved during the COVID-19. Europol is at the forefront of the law enforcement response to cyber crime and has been monitoring the situation since the start of the current crisis. UNODC is producing a policy brief under the, the lead of our Secretary General on the impact of COVID-19 on different crime types. Certainly, we have seen the opportunities for cyber criminals expanding as much of daily life has moved online. Online fraud and extortion have grown as home-based work has enlarged the potential victim pool. Phishing emails enable access to critical systems, undermining the security of individuals of organizations and of governments. Cyber criminals target hospitals and vaccine development labs with ransomware. This increased threat has, has had a direct and very real impact on vulnerable groups, in particular in developing countries. The World Wide Web Foundation has written eloquently about how the digital divide harmed the unconnected, particularly during COVID by depriving them of access to information, education, and other vital services. It is a bitter irony that the same groups like to be on the wrong, likely to be on the wrong side of the divide, namely the poor, and most of them are women, are also among the first to be preyed upon by cyber criminals when they get online. Children face ever greater dangers. In just the past few weeks, UNODC staff have supported law enforcement in two countries to investigate the live stream rape of a very young child. One of our partners found that links likely to contain child sexual abuse material on the dark web tripled to over 9,000 from just February to March. There are increasing reports of women and children being groomed and exploited online. The threat is global, it's real, and our responses must be too. Mm -hmm. At UNODC, we strengthen international cooperation and build the capacity of police prosecutors and judges to fight cybercrime and online child sexual abuse 
drawing on our expertise in countering all forms of organized crime, money laundering, and corruption. Governments that we support have brought offenders to justice. Mm -hmm. Our office has also worked with hundreds of thousands of children, parents, and teachers to help them to understand cybercrime. The role of the school here is extremely important, to stay out of harm's way and to reach out for help if they need it. This work is crucial, as we have seen so clearly in the COVID crisis, the right information at the right time can save lives. Looking ahead, we are focusing on scaling up partnerships and harnessing technologies to counter crimes against children more effectively. Raising awareness of the vulnerabilities of people online including traditionally vulnerable populations and educating the public in a targeted way. Expanding the intergovernmental dialogue to increase cooperation and support to build comprehensive capacities and innovate responses in the fight against cybercrime. This panel brings together the very actors we need to help improve global responses and protect children and vulnerable groups better, namely governments, the private sector, civil society, experts, and international organizations. UNODC is here for you, and we look forward to strengthening our work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and we look forward to continuing the uh, strong collaboration that we have always had between ITU and UNODC. And, and thank you for stressing the importance of the role that all stakeholders have uh, in, in, in trying to tackle this, this very serious issue. Um, I would now like to invite our, our next speaker. We have Catherine DeBol, who's the Executive Director of Europol. Um, Catherine, I understand that Europol has been monitoring the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the cyber crime landscape pretty much since the beginning of the crisis. Can you tell us what are the emerging cyber threats that you're seeing uh, as well as um, identifying specific cyber threats against children and also how you think that we can tackle them? Catherine, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I would also like to thank uh, Your Majesty for the valuable work you do and for the support you give also to the law enforcement uh, community in this area. As the EU law enforcement agency during this crisis, Europol is continuing to support 24-7 the law enforcement community in the fight against organized crime and in the fight against terrorism and this to enhance the security of the European citizens and as you said we have been monitoring the situation and analyzing the situation since the beginning of the pandemic we have seen the past weeks that some types of crime have increased during this period and criminals are using the pandemic as an opportunity to change their business model and to make profit. What we see is not fully unexpected because it is in the nature of organized crime groups to be flexible and to adapt quickly to new situations. As a result of the pandemic and the respective lockdowns, we have all moved online and so did criminals. Cyber criminals, they have been particularly quick in exploiting the situation and the global pandemic has become a cyber security risk with significant numbers of people teleworking, often with outdated security systems. Our overall assessment is that in the first week of the lockdowns, there, were, uh, there was a substantial increase in the volume of malicious cyber activities related to the pandemic, but currently we see that the situation is stabilizing. Phishing campaigns sharply increased and criminal groups were actively recruiting collabor collaborators to maximize the impact of their attacks or schemes. We use it crime as, we name it crime as a service. Criminal activities, they are, acti they are carried out by individual criminals or by organized crime groups. And these organized crime groups are largely the same as prior to the crisis, but some have adapted their criminal business model. We see that the dark web continues to host various platforms with attempt to innovate by offering COVID-19 related products. 
And one of the most worrying aspects are attacks on critical infrastructure and in particular against healthcare institutions. What is really worrying is that there is increased online activity by those seeking child abuse material online. This concern is being made concrete by recent data we received at Europol indicating an increase in the amount of such material being used and being made available on the dark net during this period and increase in accessing illegal websites. Due to the lockdown, especially school closures, some children are more vulnerable. They are left with less supervision and greater online exposure. And offenders attempt to take advantage of isolated children through extortion and sexual coercion. We have launched as Europol prevention campaigns to, to inform uh, parents and to inform persons responsible for children about uh, possible threats. This is why we should invest in preventive, educational and law enforcement activities to deal with this. It is too early to give you a full complete overview of the actual situation of child sexual abuse we will only probably know the full impact once reporting centers are again fully active uh, and once children are back in school and can report. However, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, NECMEC, has registered an enormous increase in reports of suspect child sexual exploitation compared to March 2019. And uh, the European Commission is now working on an EU strategy against uh, child sexual exploitation, which will be very important uh, for the law enforcement community in the European Union. Our reliance on digital solutions grow. We see that we have to make more use of our partnership, public and private sector, in organizations such as the UN and Europol play an important role and only together we are able to make a difference in increasing cybersecurity and resilience. Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, only together can we make a difference in cybersecurity and, and resilience. Thank you very much uh, for that and for all of the work that the Europol is doing. Um, now we're going to uh, shift a little bit and we're going to hear the, uh, the government perspective. Um, we will look at the, the scale of cyber threats and how governments can more actively address the threats to secure society. Uh, we are going to hear first from uh, Honorable Darsanan Balgobin. He is the Minister for uh, Information Technology, Communication and Innovation in Mauritius. Uh, and he will tell us a little bit more about the measures that his country is taking in terms of infrastructure, legislation, and policy strategies to help scale in terms of capacity, uh, also tapping into what they're doing in data management and prevention. Uh, Minister Belgabin, tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what you see in terms of the scale of the cyber threat, not only in, in Mauritius, but also across, across Africa and how do you think governments can be more proactive in addressing these threats? Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, Doreen. Warm greetings to all of you from the Republic of Mauritius. I would like to pay my respect to Her Majesty Queen Sylvia of Sweden for her contribution in this debate and other distinguished participants. At the outset, allow me to thank the Office of UN under Secretary General and the ITU for organizing this webinar in these difficult times of COVID-19 pandemic. As the crisis around the coronavirus continues to expand, organizations, including governments, are facing unexpected and profound challenges as they seek ways to allow people to stay at home and remain productive. Since the beginning of the sanitary curfew in Mauritius, 
we have noticed an increase in bandwidth consumption. Adults are using video conferencing in order to, to work from home. Students are following the online courses and there are so many people using internet. Fortunately, this 50% increase in bandwidth has not had any negative impact on the quality of service as our national network has been built with robustness and performance in mind. As the shift is occurring, cyber criminals are developing tactics to take advantage of those who have inadequate security equipment or procedures. This is big and important challenge to overcome. Of course, there is the technical aspects, which includes the use of virtual private network connections, encryption, the use of firewall, etc. But you will agree that in many cases, the human element is most fallible. As such, it is important to have comprehensive measures to educate our citizens on how to respond to cyber threats. In Mauritius, we have observed a change in the pattern of cyber threat during this lockdown period as compared to previous months. Statistics gathered from the Mauritius Cybercrime Online Reporting System reveal the following. We have witnessed an increase in scams by the factor of two and a half as compared to February. Examples of scams include extortion emails, lotteries and charity scams, fake online shops, and various fraud schemes. Similarly, fake media accounts spreading fake news and rumors have increased by the same factor over the month. Hacking attempts are now twice as prevalent as in February. Because of these alarming statistics, the government of Mauritius has taken a number of measures to make the internet more secure while allowing our citizens to work from home. Some of the measures are, one, the Mauritius Cybercrime Online Reporting System, which is an online platform for citizens to report cyber incidents as soon as they happen, to the appropriate authority, whether it is the police, the cyber crime unit of the police, the computer emergency response team, the CERT, the data protection office, or the ICT regulator. The computer emergency response team of Mauritius also issues several security alerts to the public, guidelines, and best practices on a regular basis. A dedicated section has been created and has issued a guide on how to secure a remote workforce in time of COVID-19. A security operations center, SOC, is being set up within the data center of government to monitor cyber threats in real time and prevent any cyber attacks. We are also carrying out sensitization campaigns on the radio, on national TV, to inform our citizens about the current cyber threats and especially how to react to them. And of course, we are also looking at strengthening our current legislation concerning cyber threats and cyber security. Of course, this is the beginning for us Mauritius is a small island in the middle of Indian Ocean and it is essential for us to be inspired by cybersecurity measures that other countries have put in place. And I'm sure this is also the, the wish and the way forward for other African countries. This is why I'm very happy to form part of this high level discussion today. I strongly believe that the international community should unite together to fight the cyber security, cyber attacks challenges that we could face during this COVID-19 pandemic. I thank you very much for your kind attention.
Thank you very much. Um, thank you for, for sharing the, the experience of, uh, of Mauritius and, and indeed the international community should, uh, should unite to, to, to fight these, these, these cyber attacks. Thank you for that. Uh, we now have uh, another distinguished speaker. Uh, we have His Excellency Ermas uh, Reinsalu, who's the Minister of Foreign Affairs from Estonia. Uh, Estonia has been active in responding to the increase in malicious cyber activities over the past months. And I would like to invite the minister to share his views on the role of government in securing society uh, from the growing tide of COVID-19 related threats. And also, um, your Excellency, if I could also ask you, uh, since the beginning of May, Estonia has held the presidency of the UN Security Council. If you want to share your view of, uh, about whether you think that there's a role also there uh, that the Security Council could, could play. Um, your Excellency, the floor is yours, please. Yes, so they're, uh, they're fellow humans all over the planet. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm truly grateful for ITU and uh, uh, Honorable Fabrizio Hochschild uh, for arranging that event. And um, let me stress that uh, the perspective we are in the midst of that crisis, I think it's unprecedentable uh, in many ways. And uh, it is also a first truly global crisis uh, that uh, humanity is experiencing in the digital age. And so if this is something very, very new for us, we are all pioneering in that matter. The digital development uh, has allowed us to cope with the crisis and provide time response in every phase of its involvement. And it has assisted our hospitals to collect and exchange vital information. And it has helped uh, many, uh, many people, particularly the vulnerable groups of the society, to use digital services to limit social contact. And let me stress that it will uh, continue to allow us to cope with the damage uh, that the pandemic has caused. And for a recognizable portion of the population, stable functioning of the internet has allowed us to continue working remotely. And since the beginning of the year, the world has never been more reliant on a stable and secure internet, uh, as it has stated already today uh, so many times. And it is particularly shameful particularly shameful that cyber attacks have started to erode the st stability and security. And since the start of the pandemic, attacks uh, against the healthcare sector, including some of the frontline hospitals in Europe, for example, in Czech Republic, have increased significantly. It is important to note that these activities have not remained unnoticed. Actors that use the digital space for malicious purposes will be investigated. I would like to stress today three important elements, how we can and should respond to malicious activities in cyberspace during these difficult times. First, we should call all international actors to follow the international law and norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace. Second, we, we as a, the international community should work more effectively to address cybercrime and online threats, both through our law enforcement channels and also relying on multi-stakeholder online safety communities. And third, we should pay more attention to digital and cyber capacity building globally. First, in order to call for responsible behavior in cyberspace, I have issued a statement on the 20th April condemning cyber attacks that have increased in Europe during the COVID pandemic. The crisis has put an extra stain on critical medical services and the need for a secure and functioning cyberspace is more pressing than ever. Many other uh, nations, including USA, UK, Canada, and Australia, have stepped up with similar statements on condemning cyber attacks during the crisis. Uh, just uh, last week, uh, uh, the EU High Representative uh, uh, for Foreign Policy, Joseph Borrell, released, uh, released a declaration on behalf of the uh, European Union expressing the European Union's and its member states' concern on increased number of significant cyber incidents and showing solidarity with all countries that are victims of malicious cyber activities. So therefore, uh, we should collectively call all actors in cyberspace to respect norms of responsible state behavior and to abide by international law. 
Secondly, the fight against cybercrime has been a long-standing priority for State Union. We strongly support the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime, which is currently ratified by 65 member states, and we expect more countries to join this convention as it is open to the accession of all countries globally. About two-thirds of UN member states have used the Budapest Convention as a model for international cooperation against cybercrime and as a blueprint for the domestic legislations. The convention has already helped to curb cybercrime in many regions. The state supports ongoing negotiations to include uh, a second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention to improve cross-border access to digital evidence in the context of criminal investigations. This could significantly advance our ability to respond to online crimes also during the crisis. And third, uh, the increased use of digital services during the global crisis has brought digital and cyber capacity building very much onto the focus. Cyber capacity building as one of the elements in, is uh, encompassing both bolstering cyber security and combating cyber uh, crime. And as you asked about the Estonian uh, chairmanship and Security Council, uh, we uh, were the first Security Council member uh, to call the Security Council to debate uh, on the COVID virus and its if, uh, uh, implications to the international security. Uh, it is shameful. It is shameful that we have not reached the Security Council, uh, Council resolution. Uh, we were able to do it on Ebola, uh, terrific uh, pandemic, but uh, uh, Security Council has not yet reached the uh, resolution and I hope uh, in coming weeks uh, we will manage to do that. Uh, this is at least what uh, the nations and the nations uh, who, who are facing the conflicts uh, will uh, wait for uh, Security Council. Uh, what we are going to do during the Security Council, surely all the elements and issues we will somehow, uh, it is uh, imminent will link also to COVID. For example, during the May we will have a debate on uh, protection of civilians in uh, conflicts. Surely we will take also the dimension of that crisis, how, we, uh, how the medical services should be affordable uh, in the conflicts to the uh, civilians. Uh, also working methods of Security Council. Now there is a distance uh, meeting of the Council and we need also to elaborate a uh, working mechanism, how the uh, how the Security Council and UN organs could uh, functionally uh, uh, be sustainable. Uh, also, uh, we are going to have particularly cyber security debate also during the May in Security Council. And surely this pandemics and malicious attacks that we have faced is also one element we are going to rise. Uh, so there are, uh, but all the umbrella of our issues indeed is that we would like to have a clear uh, reporting also uh, in the Security Council how the UN Secretary General's appeal to global peace in conflicts uh, during that pandemic uh, is uh, fulfilled and what can Security Council to do. Thank you very much indeed. The best to you. Stay in good health. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, and, and you too. Please stay in, in good health. So thank you for sharing what you have, uh, what you have been doing both domestically and internationally. We, we appreciate and we welcome your leadership in this space. And indeed, uh, all actors should respect um, the norms and abide by, by international law. Uh, we will now get a, a little bit of a different perspective. We're going to hear from a regulator, uh, a telecom regulator. We're going to hear from my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, Dr. Sharma is the chairman of the Telecommunications Regulatory Authority in India. Uh, doc, Dr. Sharma, I would like to invite you to share the experiences of how India is managing and from a regulator's perspective, how do you think governments can more actively address COVID-19 cyber threats? Dr. Sharma, the floor is yours, please. Uh, well, thank you, Doreen. And, uh, you know, first of all, I'm really privileged to be a part of this uh, panel. And, and, uh, and I also must compliment uh, ITU and UN for organizing this very timely kind of webinar, which explores the, you know, areas which, which are coming, you know, which are becoming very, very, the crucial in this time, especially the times of the crisis, and, and, and certainly the children are the most vulnerable and affected uh, by that uh, crisis. 
So, you know, uh, my, my view is that uh, most of us, including the experts, were outforced by a simple virus. You know, we thought it was not going to be very serious. We thought we knew how dangerous it is, uh, it was, and then discovered that it was much more dangerous than what we thought. It is the same with online safety. We do not fully appreciate the risks, even when we think we do so. Uh, the, the question is, are we prepared for what has come to be called the new normal? You know, this, this uh, working through web, uh, you know, working through di in a, in digital means. Uh, we have never seen uh, such pressure on the telecommunication infrastructure. And, and I, was, I wondered uh, how we could have coped with this 20 years back. Uh, you know, when there was nothing, uh, no, no telecommunications, so at least through this, this IT infrastructure, we do feel connected. So, uh, so what has happened is that suddenly we realized that we have all moved online in a short while. And one of the things which has happened is basically work from home. So it's not that work from home is something which has come now. It was already there, but I think it has become much more prevalent now. And what has happened, more and more users have come onto this platform of work from home, like you know, video conferencing platforms like the one which we are using right now. What has happened is that these new users are not experienced enough and their personal devices may not have been patched and updated properly, leaving both with vulnerabilities. In such an environment, it's difficult to be sure that an unsafe device is not used to connect to a corporate resource. Due to suddenness of the recent shift to online organization and individuals have been forced to improvise on the go. But this, is, this also leads to a downward spiral of reducing caution because every day's experience becomes the next day's norm for further improvisation. Sooner or later, however, calamity may strike in the form of a failure or of data being held for ransom or of information falling into wrong hands. So therefore the risks have increased many fold. The other area besides work from home is the area of the children studying and attending classes on the internet. Now because of remote learning, children have started spending an inordinate amount of time online. The parents believe they are in the class with their teachers or doing some of healthy study, but these children can easily click, click through an area to areas not con connected with their intended activities. Children are vulnerable and may trust a stranger readily, leading them into situations they are ill-equipped to handle. New applications and portals have been developed to support services which may not have gone through the normal process of validation and testing, leaving them with security loopholes. Because you know, the speed of innovation is, is really accelerated during these times and, and therefore it is always you know, quite possible that you have very patchy applications which are quite vulnerable. Uh, we know that social media platforms can be hijacked in sophisticated attacks that exploit emotional and psychological vulnerabilities in people, essentially persuading them to engage in destructive behavior against their own communities. We have just a few examples of how the surface area of attack has quickly expanded. The net result is that we have a potentially risky environment a fact that would not have escaped the notice of those intent on creating them. And as previous speakers mentioned that the attacks have suddenly increased and spirals into new, you know, sort of uh, new heights. Fortunately, however, work from home is not new. And as I said, it, most organizations, it was, it was in practice, except perhaps for an occasional phone call or non-critical email. Non-experts and children have also been using the internet for a while. Devices, software, solutions, the law and policy have evolved to offer their protection. Therefore, what I'd say is while we need to work hard to ensure online security and safety, there's no need to panic. Working online can be as productive and safe as working from the office as you know, we are realizing more and more we are realizing now. Some organizations had been encouraging this mode for the cost and productivity advantages it offers. It is now for others to learn from the experience of early adopters and to follow the best practices that have come to be defined over the years. Mm -hmm. One effect of coronavirus has been that citizens are looking towards their government for guidance. The governments can use the opportunity while connect, communicating about the virus and the spread of the disease to flag the attention of people towards threat 
that lurk in cyberspace. We in India actually have been working uh, since the uh, lockdown, and it is now about 40 days that we have been in lockdown. And, and we have all been conducting our, uh, you know, sort of businesses, in a, in a sense, online. Uh, and we have been working to ensure that the cyber threats are minimized. Uh, and ITU, uh, Doreen, in your leadership itself has brought together a wealth of information and experience that can be used by governments, corporations, and citizens to fulfill their obligations in keeping the online world safe. We must continue to work to ensure uh, that more and more you know, security uh, stuff is done to ensure online safety, both uh, for people who are working and especially for children. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it is very nice to, to see you, Dr. Sharma. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to, to move to the private sector perspective. Um, and, and Dr. Sharma sort of picked up on this point when trying to weigh sort of the positive of technology and then the negative. Um, you know, we see digital technology can be part of the problem here, but also part of the solution. And what I would like to ask my next panelists, um, the role that the private sector can play in countering cyber threats, and also some comments on, on the role of partnerships to scale up existing efforts. Uh, I'm delighted to, to welcome um, Hans Vesberg, the, the CEO of, of Verizon. Uh, Hans is also a broadband commissioner. We heard Her Majesty speak about the, the, the work that we've been doing uh, in the broadband commission. Um, so Hans, um, if I could ask you the, the role of the private sector in, in countering cyber threats, uh, and if you could also touch on including child safety, if you could cover that aspect as well. Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you, Doreen. And uh, first of all, thanks to UN, ITU, the Broadband Commission for co convening this very important meeting and discussing uh, child online safety. But also I would like to thank the, um, the Queen, Silvia, for being such an enormous leader for, for the most vulnerable in our society, uh, the children. And I'm proud as a fellow Swede to have that, but I'm also proud to be a member of the uh, Childhood Foundation United States to be part of fighting and uh, working hard to see the most vulnerable coming to a better light. Uh, let me start by talking about the crisis a little bit and coming into technology. First of all, this is an unprecedented crisis. Uh, some of us as leaders in the private sector has never seen anything like this. We have had so many crises, uh, natural disasters, bank crises, telecom crises, where we've never been part of a health crisis. It, 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 is, it requires unprecedented actions. And uh, the good thing is that the private sector, the last five years, has actually evolved. And uh, many of my colleagues in the private sector understands that decision has to be based on the four stakeholders you have. Employees, shareholders, customers, and society. And <clears throat> that balance becomes even more important in a crisis like that because the responsibility with corporation becomes even larger. I'm uh, leading a company with almost 150,000 employees uh, that has technology all across the globe. I feel a huge responsibility for acting in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic in the right way for our society. Secondly, uh, when we talk about uh, the, the technology, and we talk, of course, about mobile technology, broadband technology, and you would know uh, has been an enormous development the last couple of years, six billion mobile broadband subscription, more than 50%, uh, maybe even more, having access to internet of, of the world's population, and that will only increase. Mm -hmm. I advocated 2015 for an 18th goal, the, uh, the goal uh, in the SDGs, which was mobility, broadband, and cloud for every country in the world. And of course, in this time, we understand the importance of the technology. That's the only scalable and sustainable solution that we can uh, uh, take away all inequalities in our society. If that means telehealth, or if it's uh, remote learning, or information to understand this COVID-19, the scalable solution is technology. And we need to scale that quickly, and we need to collaborate between private and public sector. I see some good initiatives. I, I'm part of the uh, Childhood Foundation that is in the United States that is now working with New York City, for example, to combat some of those by using technology. So it's a lot of positive things and it's accentuated in this crisis where I think that some of the 
inherited processes that we have a hard time to fight digitally will go away. And that means that more people on this earth will have the same opportunity wherever they're born, wherever they come from. And that's important. But as many of my previous speakers have said, with all that positive, it comes challenges. The cyber crime is increasing on the networks. There is no doubt about that because that's, that's why you're there. Secondly, the most vulnerable can even be more exposed in times like this. And we talk about children or poor people that don't have a chance. And here, of course, technology will also play an extremely vital role to see that we use technology to combat that because the only sustainable and scalable solution will be technology. And, at, and here, a reach out to all public sectors to use technology to inform all your uh, citizens by uh, how to do tracking, tracing, how to, to self-control and understand this enormous pandemic. When it comes to uh, children online, of course, it just increases dramatically. We have uh, in our network 1,200% growth when it comes to collaboration tools. That means using video conferencing or other chat functions in, since the pandemic broke out. That's unparalleled. It's unprecedented. We've never seen anything like it. And of course, children is part of that, and they are using technology. What we as a service provider is, is doing, besides, of course, following all law uh, and regulations and, 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 and supporting what is needed for the law enforcement, is uh, push, pushing out parental control to each and every of our 120 million subscribers, that they can have parental control for, uh, for explicit content, exclude that for the children, uh, the, the privacy for the children, and not only that, see that tracking the screen time for children. We only have a usage today of roughly 25% of the parental control in the network. That's why we doubled down the last uh, eight weeks enormously on the advocacy to all our 120 million consumers about how to turn on the parental control service in order to see that you do it. That's of course is not taking away the normal uh, digital parenting that you need to do, but it's a tool that you can help. You. Another thing that I'm also encouraged about is of course NetClean that is collaborating with many on this call to see that we're coming out with digital tools in the network quickly to combat some of these uh, challenges with online safety for the children. So again, I just want to conclude that digital and scalability can only be uh, the, the solution here. And we need to collaborate over the borders in order to see that we uh, keep our children safe uh, online uh, when they now are increasing so much more uh, connectivity and it will only increase from here. So by that, I would like to thank you for convening this great meeting. Thank you so much, Hans. And indeed, digital and scalability is the only solution. And um, I'm glad that you focused also on the digital divide because the, as you said, the only scalable solution to take away inequalities is to ensure that technology is available to all. Mm -hmm. uh, and we close the, the digital divide. So thank you for that. And um, I'm with you on the digital parenting, although as a parent, <laughs> I find that very challenging. Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> thank you, Hans. Uh, so now we're going to hear from, from our next speaker, and then we're going to open up so, to some discussions. Uh, we have with us Dr. Howard uh, Taylor, who's the Executive Director of the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Howard. Uh, you have been very active in convening global leaders to drive action to protect children in the time of COVID-19. Could you tell us a little bit more about the role of that multi-stakeholder partnership uh, and what it's doing to keep children safe? Please. Thank you, Doreen. Good morning. Good morning, Fabrizio, Your Majesty, uh, Your Excellences and others. And thank you so much, Fabrizio and Doreen, for bringing us together today. Uh, it feels like we're talking about a very critical issue at a very critical time for that issue. So I will, as you say, speak specifically uh, about keeping children safe online. Uh, for some years, there's been a huge mismatch between the scale and the nature of the risks that children face online and the levels of awareness, of attention, and action to address the problem. And those risks have really been brought into sharper relief during this time now of the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that about one and a half billion children are now out of school. We know they're doing more online. We know they're spending more time online. 
We also know that those who wish to harm them uh, may be more easily able to do so by working from the privacy of their homes. So I really feel we have a very strong responsibility to immediately scale up our collective and our collaborative action to keep children safe online. I also hope, and I'm optimistic that in doing so, we have an unprecedented opportunity within and coming out of COVID-19 over the coming months and the years, both to protect children more in the short term, but trigger new levels of awareness, new levels of resources, new levels of action to keep all children safe online for the future. For those less familiar with the Global Partnership and Fund to End Violence Against Children, we were launched by the UN Secretary General four years ago with a mission to catalyze and support action to end all forms of violence and abuse of children by 2030, including online and the horrific child sexual exploitation and abuse that happens to so many children online. We're a diverse networking community. We have now over 400 partners across all sectors, across all borders, and that community and network really enables us to mobilize action, generate learning, shape global models, and scale collaboration. All of that is needed to build the prevention and the response capacity globally and to inform the global agendas and debates, for example, those on making sure that child safety is built into the, the critical expansion of internet access and connectivity, but also debates around privacy and protection, encryption, AI, et cetera. Um, we are the only global entity making targeted investments to tackle online child sexual exploitation and abuse. And this year, the M-Violence Fund will reach a milestone of $50 million invested in programs of capacity building and cutting edge technology in over 70 countries. All of that is focused on tackling online child sexual exploitation and abuse. But, and it's a big but, neither that unique role nor our financial investments are a badge of honor. They both simply reinforce my earlier point, which is the mismatch between the scale of the problem and the global response to tackle it. So with regards to how a partnership like the M Violence Partnership in the Fund can work and is working to scale up existing efforts. I wanna speak really briefly to three things. One is around understanding the needs of children and those working to keep them safe online. The second is around how we use our collective voice to do that awareness raising and calling for specific actions. And the third is around collaboration. Collaboration to mobilize and provide the technical and financial resources that are needed to get the job done. With regards to understanding the needs of children and those working to keep them safe online, everything that we do, both now in this crisis moment and beyond, must continue to be evidence-based. And we've used our networks in the last few weeks, reaching out across the world to understand how COVID-19 is impacting on children, um, both online and offline, and the increased risks that they face domestically, online, etc. And we've also used those networks to understand how the organizations and individuals championing and working to keep children safe online have been impacted. And what we're doing with that body of evidence, that body of knowledge, is making sure it informs our ongoing response and what we share with and the work we do with partners and the collaboration. The second area, and you mentioned this, Doreen, about using collective voice to raise awareness for specific actions. One of the things we've been involved with was convening 22 heads of UN agencies and global organizations around a leader's statement, which was expressing concern um, about the impact of violence and abuse on children through COVID-19. Uh, but also calling for specific actions and pledging support uh, to help get that, uh, implement those actions. That leader statement called on governments to make sure that child protection uh, was woven into COVID-19 prevention and response plans, that that workforce was seen as essential and it was resourced accordingly. And also we called on tech and telecoms companies to make sure they're doing all they can uh, to make their platforms safe and to step up the detection and disruption of harmful activity where it is continuing. And we've been encouraged by some of the things we've seen. One of the particular things we've been involved with was with um, the governments of the UK, US, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, uh, and a bunch of the West Coast technology firms and platforms with a PSA campaign that went live, I think about 10 days ago, and we've been involved in supporting, uh, supporting some of that. I'd like to do, actually, as I speak about voice and action, to particularly give a big thanks to, to Her Majesty Queen Sylvia. It's always good to hear from her. Um, and she has been an enduring advocate for children for 20 years or more. Um, and I just want to call out the work that she and the World Childhood Foundation does in this space. It's been critical for the agenda for years, even more so now. And of course, to the Secretary General, who's been a very vocal champion and advocate for child online safety during the COVID-19 time and beyond. And again, to Fabrizio and your team for championing and supporting that work. The third issue I wanted to speak to was around uh, collaboration to mobilize the technical and financial resources needed. I've been really encouraged in the last few weeks, as we sometimes do see in a crisis moment, where 
the breadth, the depth, the speed of collaboration has been really impressive. Uh, and I mentioned that because I think that's something we need to hold on to as a community across the various sectors, um, private, UN, NGOs, and beyond academics to make sure um, that that essence and ways of working sustain through the crisis, but beyond the crisis. I think that's essential to getting the work done. We've been very privileged to work with UNICEF, with the WHO, UNESCO, UNODC, ITU. We protect Global Alliance, the Australian Safety Commissioner and others um, in, in, a, in a collaboration which has put together a series of technical guidance materials, resource packages, messages for policymakers and for parents and caregivers, now translated into dozens of languages. And even the speed of the translation has been really fast. I've never seen a document be translated into dozens of languages as fast as those have, and now being used across the world to keep children safe online. So that's just an example of the sorts of things that if we work efficiently and effectively together, we can work with a larger crowd than we've done before and really get stuff done uh, that needs doing. Uh, I'll close by noting that keeping children safe online isn't just the right thing to do, it's also a smart investment to make, both now and for the future, and we know what's needed to get that done. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed, I think, in new ways, the extraordinary mismatch between the scale of the problem and action to keep children everywhere safe online, but it is also raising awareness, it is growing attention, it is inspiring new networks and collaboration. We must, of course, do all we can and step up further to keep children safe online now, but as the world transitions through the new realities in the months and years ahead, let's all work together to shape and to seize the opportunity to build back a safe internet for every child, wherever they may live. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Doreen and Fabrizio. It's great to see so many partners on the webinar this morning, and we look forward to partnering with you all on this really critical work. Thank you so much, uh, Howard, and, and we look forward to continuing to, to partner with, with you. Uh, when Han spoke, he, talk, he talked about the unprecedented crisis and the need for unprecedented actions. And you've sort of spinned it as well another way about the unprecedented opportunities. Uh, and indeed, it, this is a very smart investment for all of us to, to, to be making. So thank you. Thank you for that and for the work that, that you do. Uh, so now this is sort of the final part of our discussion. And I think I'm only uh, two minutes behind. So... Uh, so far, so good. I haven't had to use my yellow and red cards. Uh, and so for this last part of our discussion, I'd like to focus on specific actions. So specific actions in response to COVID-19 related cyber threats. Uh, we have some guest discussants and I would like them each to make a two minute intervention. Um, I will use my yellow and red as I have to when you get to maybe a minute and a half, I'll give you the yellow card. Um, so I will hand over to our first uh, discussant. We have uh, Francisco Fonseca. Uh, he is the Vice President of the National Cybersecurity uh, at BitSight. Francisco, you have the floor. Can we unmute Francisco, please? So I would like to start by thanking you for the opportunity to be here today and share with everyone the program that we built with ITU. The worldwide changes associated with the COVID-19 pandemic have not only impacted all of our lives, they've created a rich environment for cyber attacks. In the last few weeks, we've had several countries come to us requesting that we help them with monitoring their hospitals. In that regard, together with ITU, we've created a program that will help member states to reduce the cyber risk of the entities involved in the COVID-19 response. This could include hospitals, the Ministry of Health, civil protection authorities, energy and electricity providers, and any other critical national infrastructure. Together, we'll make available to member states, at no cost, a solution that will allow them to continuously monitor for security issues associated with any organization involved in the COVID-19 response. Member states will be allowed to share that information with those entities for remediation and mitigation purposes. We are hopeful that this will reduce the chance of cyber attacks and help to preserve those entities that are at the front lines of the crisis. Because we know that sometimes the time to respond to security incidents can be critical, we've implemented specifically for this program a mechanism that whenever we detect an infection inside an entity, 
will inform the member states within the first 10 minutes after the infection is detected. We believe this program will enable the member states to protect themselves, their key industries and their constituents during a period where risk management is imperative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you so much for, for keeping with, uh, with the time. You came in at one minute, 40 seconds, thank you. Um, now I'm gonna hand over to uh, Mr. Ian uh, Drennan. He's the executive director of We Protect Alliance. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to to all the speakers and for giving me the chance to uh, to talk. Um, we Protect Global Alliance is the largest and most diverse um, international network to to tackle online child sexual abuse, and we launched as an independent international institution um, on the first of April, having previously been located within the the UK government. Um, we're currently working on a threat assessment um, on the impact of COVID-19 on the threat from online child uh, sexual um, abuse. Um, we welcome um, any input from those around the table. We hope to publish that um, next week. Um, many of the speakers have already spoken about um, the increase in threat, but what we're also seeing is there's been an impact on the response. Um, so reporting services have been disrupted where those rely still on um, human moderation. And also for um, those very, very important uh, services of support for victims, um, those have been disrupted and that's added to the increased levels of mental health um, issues and anxiety caused by, um, caused by isolation is adding to the, to the threat. Uh, but we welcome all input um, from colleagues around the table and uh, thank you very much for a really informative webinar. Thank you very much and thank you also for, for keeping with the time. Next we have the President and CEO of Childhood USA. We have Dr. Joanna Rubenstein. Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the opportunity to address this uh, amazing group and thank you so much Your Majesty Queen Sylvia for your global leadership on this issue for the last 20 years. Um, as a Broadband Commissioner of the ITU UNESCO Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development and a former co-chair of the Working Group on Child Online Safety, uh, I just wanted to reiterate the commitment of the Commissioners and the Commission on keeping children safe online. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Broadband Commission issued a statement, the COVID Agenda for Action for short-term and long-term actions, uh, helping with the recovery post-COVID. And one of the very important actions was to really engage uh, globally on keeping children safe online and using the existing tools that we have today and scaling them up, but also using some of the social media platforms and the voices of the government to raise awareness about the issue of threats and harm online that already today affect so many millions of children. The other commitment, I think, which is very important, and I'm grateful to Hans Westberg and for his leadership in the US, it's to really ensure that uh, people use the tools on the networks and that the educational platforms are prepared in such a way that they don't expose children to unnecessary harms. Mm -hmm. From our side of Childhood USA and also different partners, when some of them I see here online, like RAIN, the largest uh, hotline in the US, is to ensure that the same platforms that children use also have reporting functions so that people know how to report. I think these are very practical steps that we all can take, but it just requires our will and action. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, will and action, totally agree. Thank you for that. So now we're gonna hear from Mr. Rahman Sama, the Asia <laughs> Policy Director and Senior International Council at Access Now, please. Access Now, please. Thank you so much for that. So yes. I just wanted to briefly mention Access Now's area of work. We, as many of you may know, work in the space of 
protecting human rights in the digital age. As part of that, we run a digital security helpline, a clinic that provides assistance to civil society organizations and other vulnerable communities and user at risk groups. I can share that as you might expect with the increase in working from home, but increased vulnerabilities generally in our networks globally. We've seen a dramatic increase in the number of helpline cases coming to us. In fact, the last month, we have seen a three digit increase in the number of cases, our largest increase per month in the helpline since its existence. Why I mention this is twofold. One, that any group that works in the civil society, investigative journalism, humanitarian and human rights space can use our helpline for free. You can just search online at Access Now Digital Security Helpline or just email help, H-E-L-P, at accessnow.org. And we try to provide both reactionary and preventive assistance for free to society groups globally, particularly across the global south in ODA countries. And that is an immediate actionable service that we make available to everyone and we hope might be useful for you and stakeholders you all engage with. I thought I'd also mention from the public policy side, we provide guidance and recommendations in this space. And we just wanted to reiterate that the many of the trends that many other stakeholders have mentioned on this call about how COVID is increasing vulnerabilities, but also an increase in cyber attacks is something we believe must reflect also in our global policy discussions in this space. We hope to soon publish a new policy resource on global cybersecurity policy recommendations at the international as well as regional levels for stakeholders, particularly states to use. And as part of that, we wish to just remind all members that we particularly need to keep in mind the work done by the security research community in revealing vulnerabilities, backdoors, exploits, and other intrusion into our secure networks. The COVID situation has reminded us even more of the importance of that. And far too often, unfortunately, their work is often subject to problematic policy frameworks or even criminalization in some states. And there's an opportunity right now at this point of time, perhaps to reform those measures and to ensure that COVID, while it might place us at risk in health, doesn't place us at risk in terms of our cyber security and resiliency. And that is something that the policy community can do much more on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, the Assistant Director General from UNESCO. We have Moez with us. Can we? Thank you, Thank you Zorin. Thank you, Fabrizio, for giving me the opportunity to, to address uh, this, uh, this webinar. I want to highlight here the importance of capacity building and education. Of course, I think it was a very important highlight uh, that uh, the media and information literacy as a curriculum for schools and, and, and for children is very important to highlight the importance of uh, to, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the approaches focused on the users while dealing with security and digital security. Uh, this is an important aspect that we need to consider and of course it's uh, not, not to, and to, and to um, highlight that uh, the solutions or the tools or whatever we, we, uh, we want to implement uh, to, to, to improve the security doesn't compromise uh, the freedom of expression and the human rights uh, in, the, uh, in the online. This is very important for UNESCO perspectives as we know that uh, we, uh, we uphold the four universal principles for the internet governance. So I think this is uh, very important to, to be highlighted while talking with uh, digital security, while dealing with digital security. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Moez. And I have, Junghee, I have been uh, checking the chat and I've seen uh, a wealth of great exchanges with lots of uh, useful information. Was there another request for the floor before we conclude? Junghee? Yes, there is no, we don't have any floor request from the chatting room. Okay, super. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. thank you. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. This has been really um, a tremendous uh, discussion, uh, very important and, of course, very timely. Uh, I'm really delighted that we were able to have such a, a multi-stakeholder representation in this dialogue, including, uh, of course, UN agencies, uh, regional organizations, government ministries, regulators, the private sector, and of course, civil society. Um, if there is one certainty in these challenging times, and I think this has been heard clearly throughout our, our discussion uh, this afternoon, is that this issue cannot be solved in isolation. And if we are going to make real headway in combating the rise in cybercrime and the regrettable 
a rise in online child abuse, we need to be proactive. Uh, we all need to be proactive, and that means everyone. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, these threats are not new, uh, but in today's challenging um, context with the, the COVID pandemic, the, the magnitude of the risk to our society, our economy, and our children has multiplied tremendously. We need to work harder uh, to improve awareness, preparedness. We heard a lot of comments about education. Uh, I was encouraged to hear UNODC stress the role of schools uh, and what schools can do in, in, in keeping children safe. Uh, and indeed, many speakers stress that uh, more and better education will be key, particularly for vulnerable, vulnerable groups like children, women, and poorer communities. Uh, and I will make sure from my side that, that I feed that into our own work here in the ITU and in our GIGA work with, uh, with UNICEF and of course with, uh, with UNESCO and the work we do around digital inclusion and training. Several speakers also stress the importance of capacity building, uh, both at home and also across borders. Uh, we need to find collaborative ways to help those of us with strong capabilities to share their expertise and best practices with countries and organizations that are less well equipped. Uh, because when it comes to keeping ourselves safe online, uh, we are only as strong as the weakest link and none of us can be safe until we are all safe. I noted also um, a call from, from several of our speakers for uh, frameworks that support cross-border collaboration of law enforcement. Uh, as Catherine from Europol observed, when the world uh, moved online, so did the criminals. Uh, so recognition and application of international legal frameworks, and this was stressed uh, very clearly by Estonia, uh, that represents a solid way forward. And I think that there's no doubt that, that we, we do need to start making uh, much faster progress in this domain. Uh, and finally, I noted with encouragement the fact that we can harness technology more effectively. And I encourage the private sector to, uh, to follow Verizon's very good example and, and focus on innovating and scaling uh, and harnessing the, uh, the power of digital tools to combat the, the bad guys. Um, I also wanted to, to extend a, a special thanks, of course, to, to Her Majesty um, whose, whose remarks were, were, were really moving and, and very, very, very powerful. Uh, and as she noted in the beginning, we must remember that the perpetrators uh, are not digital and neither are the victims and that the crimes against them uh, can stay online forever. And the virus has no borders and criminals know no borders. And that's why cross-border collaboration is absolutely so, so vital. Um, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope I did justice to a sort of summary. It was a, it was a tremendous discussion and I tried to keep time and take notes at the same time. So I apologize if I, if I missed an important element. Uh, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, I will hand back to Fabrizio to, uh, to make his, his concluding remarks. Fabrizio, the floor is yours. Thank you, Doreen. And I think I speak for all when I say you did a really outstanding job and uh, we, we all appreciate that. I must say, um, I can't help but uh, notice, looking at the participants by video screen, that it's very easy that there hasn't, looking at different people's uh, hairstyles. And as you, I have to apologize for my own uh, rather unkempt look. And I see uh, when I look at Moe's, um, you, you can tell that both in Paris and New York, I'm afraid there's still no access uh, to barbers or coiffeurs. And I'd like to congratulate the participants from Sweden and Geneva, who clearly uh, have better um, access, but hopefully we'll get there uh, as well. Um, coming back to the subject matter, um, you know, I think as was pointed out, this unprecedented times lead to unprecedented challenges. Um, and we, we need, not to reinvent the wheel, but to step up actions. We also need to acknowledge, and I think Catherine de Bol said this, that the most vulnerable are the most um, exposed. Uh, and so whatever we do, we have to focus on the most vulnerable in our societies 
And of course, that includes, uh, in particular, children. Um, in terms of um, uh, stepping up action on the basis of existing tools, uh, I, I think uh, I heard sort of five lines of, of action um, to try and organize the points that Doreen also made. One is, um, the first is stepped up action by law enforcement um, through, in, uh, uh, as well as um, through our educational uh, institutions. And a third layer is through our individual actions to better protect ourselves and our families through adequate security action personally. But that has to be complemented by educational uh, institutions and of course by law enforcement. Secondly, I think there was a call for much more proactive action by many uh, companies. And I think one has to acknowledge that while some companies are extremely proactive, others um, rely on reports uh, before they take action on child abuse, while others go out and actively search for harmful content on their platforms. I think the call is that all should become actively uh, proactive in searching out for harmful um, content. And then there was also a call for stepping up of technical tools, um, including um, the tools that allow for better parental control. The third call, I think, was for better uh, cooperation against uh, cross sectors. And of course, this meeting itself is an illustration of what can be done. No, law, governments are not going to solve this on their own, companies are not going to solve this on their own, and civil society are not going to solve this on their own. And the UN is certainly not going to solve it on its own, with all due respect to my ITU colleagues. We're only going to solve it to the extent we can work effectively together. And that cooperation between different stakeholder groups needs to be um, stepped up. The fourth aspect I want that came out, I think, was the need for better capacity building. And that's, again, a, an, I, a, an area where a multi-stakeholder coalition could do more. The, the ability of different countries to protect themselves varies enormously. So we need to step up um, capacity building to reduce vulnerabilities in those geographic regions where they're greatest. And fifth is the need for greater international cooperation. We need cooperation not just to be increased between different stakeholder groups, but we need it to be increased across borders. And of course, we heard a very eloquent um, uh, 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 elaboration of the dysfunctionality, forgive my word, um, of the Security Council at this moment. So the international environment is not the most propitious to call for international cooperation, but it is urgently needed in this sector if we are to make people connected but safe uh, at the same time, and in particular uh, our children. And I don't think, uh, while there are areas where there is a lack of international consensus, uh, there is no lack of international consensus in the need to better protect children everywhere. So I hope in that area, at least, we can agree, achieve better international cooperation. So those are my five takeaways. As I say, it's as much about stepping up existing initiatives as creating new ones. But I'd like to thank all, and in particular, our very, very distinguished and very enlightening and inspirational uh, speakers uh, for their participation. And I hope this is just the beginning of strength and collaboration and work together between all of us. Many, many thanks. And please, please stay safe, uh, both from the virus and from those viruses that come to us uh, over the internet. Thank you so much, Fabrizio. And as someone noted on, on the chat, and I pick up your, your last statement, uh, they put the Henry Ford quote, uh, coming together is the beginning. Uh, keeping together is progress and working together is success. So let's aim for that. Thank you so much. And again, uh, I really appreciate all of the, the comments, the interventions, and lots of great stuff on the chat. I thank you all for your engagement. We were up to uh, more than, than 400 participants uh, at one point. And I do hope that you will join us next week, uh, same time, same place, uh, for our fifth and final webinar. Uh, next week, we will be focusing on the topic of public health digital technologies and human rights. Uh, and with that, again, I thank you. Big thanks to Jung Hee for your brilliant organization. Uh, and please be safe, everyone. Thank you.